Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with the neatest people in the industry. Today's episode is with guest Michael Lowenstern, who's someone I've been looking forward to chat with on this show, actually since before it began. Um, I've been inspired by his work for a really, really long time, and apparently I'm not the only one. Many people who submit questions to the podcast, or recommendations, or suggestions, I guess, for, for guests they almost all include Michael Lowenstern on the list. So he's someone that a lot of people were really looking forward to hear. And I'm thrilled to have the chance to bring him to you today. We had a really great chat. um, But one of the things that happened as I was starting to prepare the interview is we got so many listener questions that I thought, you know what, back in episode nine, when we interviewed Martin Frost, we sort of ran out of time for listener questions. So to sort of give back to the listeners, I thought, why don't we make this interview entirely about listener questions and lucky I did because we filled up an entire hour even more a little bit with all these questions and uh, I hope we can have Michael back in the future but I do feel actually that we touched on a lot of great stuff and uh, I really want to take a moment to thank everyone who sent in those questions to ask Michael. For those who may not be aware, which I think actually is rather few of you, Michael Lowenstern is widely considered one of the finest bass clarinetists in the world. He's performed, recorded, and toured as a soloist with ensembles as diverse as the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, Steve Reich Ensemble, and the Klezmatics. He trained at the Interlochen Arts Academy, the Eastman School of Music, Stony Brook University, and the Swelink Conservatorium in Amsterdam, studying clarinet and bass clarinet with Charles Nidich, Harry Sparnai, Richard McDowell, and John Broussier. Not satisfied with the status quo in music education, Michael's irreverent and somewhat controversial YouTube series has become a source of information and entertainment for millions of viewers around the globe. And when he's not teaching via the internet, he's traveling regularly as a guest lecturer at universities across the world. When he's stuck in New York City, though, Michael serves on the faculty of Manhattan School of Music and the Juilliard School. And when he's not doing all that, he's hanging out in Brooklyn with his family. I've included on the show notes page links to relevant things mentioned on this episode, so make sure to head over to www.clarineat.com to check those out. I've also started including some timestamps in there, so if you go back later looking for something, you'll be able to find it. The giveaway for this episode is a signed copy of one of Michael's CDs. To make sure you're eligible to win items mentioned on this podcast, including an upcoming giveaway from Bakun Musical for a Bakun Alpha clarinet, please make sure to subscribe to our email list. Again, check www.clarineat.com, enter your email address, and click subscribe. This episode was brought to you by Daddario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daddario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. So I'm here today with Michael Lowenstern, who has been, I think, the most requested person of all time. Every time I ask someone who they want to hear on this show, they always mention Michael Lowenstern. So here we are. We're finally here. And I want to welcome you to the show, Michael. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, Sean. So we're going to do a different kind of episode here, and the reason I'm doing this is because with some of these guests, uh, we've just had a just a huge wall of questions, and um, I thought that instead of me taking my questions and sort of putting them in front of the listeners, I thought I'd flip that around. So we're actually going to do a whole bunch of listener questions all in a row and just see if we can get through this list, actually. Great. So um, let's get started here. So I want to start with Reddit questions. And uh, the reason I'm going to start with this is because Reddit is actually where this sort of AMA or ask me anything concept comes from, I believe. Are you familiar with that, Michael? Oh, yeah. You've seen that? Okay. So these are from the Reddit uh, subreddit community r slash clarinet rather. So just a huge shout out to them. And uh, thanks for submitting these. So the first question is from M Bartholomew5. Um, he says, what is your warm-up routine on bass and how or whether or not it should differ for a soprano clarinet warm-up? So I actually use the same warm-up uh, for both. I, uh, when I have enough time to do a, like a really good warm-up, like when I say, I say I have a half an hour to do a warm-up, uh, I will always start with the Kelly Burke long tone exercise. They, she has three of them in her, in her compendium, which is a terrific book. Um, and so I do, I do long tones. Uh, 
really just first to get a sound uh, in, in my ear. I think of this sort of as meditation, you know, at the beginning of, of a playing day. I will often do it in the beginning of my day. So um, I sit and I just kind of feel the instrument and feel what it sounds like and feel how my reads are going to be for the day. Then after that, I'll move on to maybe, maybe, you know, a scale or two or something like that if I'm feeling the need for that. I may play an etude, uh, which is usually... Uh, going to be something from Polacek or something from the Voxman Classical Studies, and then I'll dig into whatever it is that is my main course for the day. But for my warm up, it's it's always starts with long tones. The next question is actually kind of related to that. This is from Doctor Fibbles. <laughs> um, so he says, "How would you recommend keeping up with the bass and B flat skills at the same time?" Um, so, like, I guess he sort of elaborates and says, it's "Kind of keeping in shape on both instruments." It's difficult. And to be honest, I mean, if you are a doubler and you have to play the saxophones as well, you've got to get reeds going for all of them. I mean, it, it, it is not easy. But if you're just playing clarinet and bass clarinet, it's still not easy because, you know, the whole, the whole setup for me, I found bass clarinet always to be easier to get like a reed that worked and everything was just, it came a little bit easier. Clarinet I found to be much more difficult and keeping up on the clarinet uh, has always been more difficult for me. But I would tend to, um, you know, play bass clarinet for a day or two, play clarinet for a day or two. When I was in college, I would play them both uh, the same day, but I'd split it up. Like I'd do one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I never practice both of them at the same sitting because the embouchure and everything is so different for me. But then, you know, if I was preparing for a piece that would require I play both of them one right after the other, something by Schoenberg, for example, where I have to, or something in an orchestra where I have to play both, uh, I would actually play those pieces specifically and practice the, uh, um, you know, the transitions between the two and the transitions between embouchures and the transitions between the reeds and all that stuff. So it's, it's not an easy task, but it's something that, you, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. That's mine. So I'm just going to elaborate on that for a second, if we can here. Um, do you also play E flat? No. No? Uh, yeah, because I think the people who play E flat also have this problem. Um, but I just was imagining with three different clarinets, it would be even more crazy. Um, but what about as far as um, some bass clarinetists now feel that you can completely specialize in bass clarinet? Are you one of those people or are you more in the camp that you think people should have to play both or that you kind of can't get by without playing both? Well, it depends on what your goal is, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. if, you, want, if you want a career in music... Uh, the more you play, the more opportunities you make for yourself, right? So if you just play bass clarinet and you go out into the world and say, you know, I am Michael and I only play the bass clarinet, people who are looking for clarinet players, and if you play clarinet, that could have been you, they're not going to call you. So if you're trying to do bass clarinet for a living, you darn well better have uh, some solid clarinet chops as well, because it's rare for anybody to be able to make a living as a bass clarinet player. Now, me, for example, I don't make my living as a musician anymore. Uh, I'm, I make my living in advertising, and I, you know, about 10 or 11 years ago, I ran away and joined the office, and I do that. I, I make ads for, <laughs> for big companies, but then I'm able to, you know, do what I want to do. I don't have to rely on, on the bass clarinet or music in general as a living. But when I did for the first 15 or 20 years of my career, definitely I went out as both a clarinet and a bass clarinet player. And I am a strong, strong supporter that if you're going to play the clarinet, uh, you need to play the bass clarinet. And if you're going to play the bass clarinet, you need to play the clarinet, period. Yeah, I think a lot of clarinet players actually myself included, really should be playing more bass clarinet. But um, another thing, I think Harry Sparnai and Catherine Ladano, who both very much focus on bass clarinet and kind of think that it, they really think that it can be its own entity. However, they say that you really have to get into new music because that is the music for the instrument. How would you feel about that? Let's, you know, if you look at what Harry Sparnai did for his career, yes, uh, he, he told me when I studied with him in 1989 that he had lent his clarinet to his student, quote, years ago, unquote, and <laughs> forgot, forgot who he gave it to. And so he only owned a bass clarinet. I'm not quite sure I believe that. But, uh, you know, here's a guy that he is the best in the world. And he is teaching at, I don't know, two or three different conservatories around Amsterdam. And he's cobbling together a career for himself. Catherine is the same way. Uh, I think Sarah Watts is the same way, though I'm not sure. Maybe she does play more clarinet. There are a number of people who can do it. But, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, of course, there's people who do do it. But is it? it's not the best odds, maybe. Um, here's the Again, third. It, Sorry, go ahead. It's, it's really just what what you want out of your musical life and what you want out of your non-musical life, frankly. I mean, you, you, 
we all have lives and we need to eat and enjoy ourselves and enjoy our families and enjoy our friends. And frankly, that takes money. And yeah. in order to do that, you need to make a living. And in order to make a living, you need to be really realistic about what you want to do for your career part of your life. Absolutely. So here is a question from someone called uh, The Strid. I don't know what that means. Um, but it says, which neck strap do you use or do you recommend people use? Oh, this is easy. I um, I personally use one that was made uh, by a former student of mine, Philip Everall. Uh, he would make tons of them for me and ship me like, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them and I'd be able to sell them and I would sell out immediately and then he'd have to make them more. He made them by hand. And then he went ahead and had a kid, <laughs> which basically that, that, that's now his craft project. No longer is bass clarinet strap making his craft project. So <laughs> how <course>. selfish <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but actually right now I, I really like, um, if you're going to have to go out and buy, um, a sort of mass produced one, I would check out the, the Van Doren, Barry Sachs strap. It's a little bit of a contraption, uh, but I find it to be really comfortable. That said, I'm trying to get Philips straps made mass produced. And when I have those ready, the world will know about it. But uh, I, I, I find that those straps that Philip has, they're lighter, they're easier to use, they're more portable. Um, but it, since they're not available, the Van Doren one, I've, I've used that a lot and I, I find it to be comfortable and good. Where will the world know about it? Are you going to try and release it on your website or... Yeah, you know, I'll do it on a YouTube thing. I'll do a Gear Wars about straps or something like that. And what's that strap like? Is it, how is it different from other straps for those who've never seen it? Sure. So it um, you have to wear a belt. That's the only caveat um, for the for Philip Everall's strap. You have to wear a belt, and it's seat belt material. That's what the strap is made of. So it's it's a, it's a really really strong fabric. So did you say seat belt? Yeah. Like a car. Like a car. Oh. Okay. Uh, it's a really tough material. Anyway, it, it clips with a button behind your back on the back of your belt. So that is how it attaches to your body because your belt is attached to your pants, which is attached to your body, and the strap attaches to that. Then it goes up and across behind your back and over your shoulders and into a, a, a clip. Uh, what's great about it is that there's no – it's not really a neck strap. It's a shoulder strap, and it's the, the harness itself. It takes all the weight off of your neck. I don't like having neck straps because – you got a lot of important crap going through your neck and you don't really want a, you know, 10 pound bass clarinet hanging off of it. So I prefer to just use something that goes over your shoulders. Yeah. You know, I've always sounded like kind of funny, actually. I always feel like I'm wearing a noose or something when I, I don't like wearing neck straps, but you have to sometimes. You, you do, unless you, you know, unless you pick up one of these things. I, I haven't used a neck, neck strap ever. So. Interesting. Well, and that Van Dorn one, is that the one that's kind of like a harness? You yeah, discussed? It is. yeah, yeah. It's got some plastic on it. It's a it's a contraption, but it's it's pretty clever. Um, I think it's their their version one. I imagine that they will refine it a little bit. At least I hope they do, because it is a little it's a little clunky. Hmm. Interesting. I'll check those out. Maybe some of these things you've mentioned. I'll put links in the show notes if people are interested in, in checking that out. So the next question here, um, this username is kind of offensive, so I'm not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> you can count on Reddit for that. Anyways, the question is, uh, tell him that I just wanted to let him know that his black bass is so beautiful. If I had one of those, I would care for it more than my own life. <laughs> wow. Um, what? Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just, I'm reacting to that. Wow. There's lots of talk about that bass clarinet. Um, I was going to throw in a question here. What's the story on it? Uh, it's really simple, Sean. I, I always, always wanted a matte black bass clarinet. I've been talking about it for 10 or 15 years. And, um, so I got one <laughs> really, <laughs> where can was, we get one? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I, I think Wolfgang Loaf has them. I know Selmer actually has made another one for someone in Korea. I've seen, oh, really? uh, yeah, I've seen a picture of a second one. Um, so I think Selmer may make them. It is the black is not paint. It's not lacquer. It's actually black chrome. So it's chrome that they do some kind of, um, they put in, I think they may electroplate it. They do something to it. It's originally not black and they do some kind of voodoo to it and it turns it black and it's really, uh, it's really fused well to the key. So it's not going to scratch off. So it's not like, um, cause I thought maybe it was anodized or yeah, painted or I wasn't sure, but it's actually like a chrome black. Mm -hmm. wow. It's chrome black. And, and I had the option, uh, if I wanted it shiny, it comes out shiny. I said, no, I wanted it matte. So they sandblasted it. Oh, wow. Uh, to, to make the keys matte, which gives them a really nice feel. They don't feel smooth and slick like other, you know, like normal, like silver keys or nickel keys. They, they have a little bit of a texture to them. That's amazing. Actually, I was going to ask about that because that's one of the things that's always bothered me. Some people love the slidiness of keys. 
but it's always something that I've never been a huge fan of, actually. So they are more or less slippery, I guess. Oh, far less slippery. Um, so, do you ever have to slide between them though, and sort of wish they were slippery, or you don't? Find Not, that yet. Sl- Not yet. Not yet. Uh, you know, if I do, uh, I always use the nose grease method, and <laughs> then, then I just wipe it off when I'm done. Well, I tell you, this is why I personally prefer silver over nickel. Um, for the same reason, I find it's got more kind of stick to it. Agreed. I totally so. agree. Anyways, so that's the Reddit questions, and uh, those are some really good ones, and thanks again for submitting those, folks. Um, I can't believe I just said folks. That's just an odd, <laughs> such an <laughs> odd thing. Anyway, so the email questions. We had one um, from someone named Jeff Hodes, or Hodes here. I'm not sure how to say that. Sorry. But he says, do you recommend practicing in a boomy resonant space or muffled dry ones? Um, and what do you think about practicing in the bathroom? If, if you have the opportunity to practice in what I would call an ego room, you know, a room with a lot of resonance and stuff like that, uh, like a bathroom or, a, gosh, a concert hall, go bo- for it. The it, backyard? Yeah, the, well, the backyard is different. Um, <laughs> but but if, you, if you're able to practice in a nice space that gives you a nice sort of your ego a nice boost, go ahead. But it certainly makes it harder for you to be able to hear the problems in your playing. So if you're playing just for fun and you're playing to get a sense of a space in a hall or whatever, cool. Uh and I do it uh, if I need if I need that. But if you're really doing some hard work and you want to be able to hear yourself well, it's best to be in a space that's not so reverberant, you know, with a lot of echo. Um, playing outside actually is not is not especially useful because it's really hard to hear yourself because your sound just goes out into space and there's nothing to reflect it back to you. So it's sometimes harder to hear. So if you're going to be if you're going to be in a room, it's better to be in a room that's not especially bright. So bathrooms are great if you want a boost. But it's good to be in a maybe a, a quieter, drier space. Sorry for my joke there. I was referring to your Bach in the backyard video. It was just a totally. I, <laughs> I, no, I, I got the reference totally. Oh, okay, and you've also done uh, Bach in the bathroom. I think there's another yeah, which, one like that. Yeah. Yeah, which is just sort of to talk about the fact that bathrooms are are a good place to practice if you need. Uh, if you, first of all, if you want privacy, because the door usually locks, <laughs> uh, and uh, and and it and it has a lot of tile, which makes it sound better. And for those who are interested or who don't know, I assume most people listening will, but um, Michael has a great YouTube channel. I think it's called Ear Spasm. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, it just is a whole kind of treasure trove of uh, different videos about the bass clarinet. And uh, I think it's probably one of the most comprehensive online resources for bass clarinetists, would you say? Uh, well, that, that's generous, but thank you. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great resources online for bass clarinet all over the place, um, but I'm I'm glad that mine is... Uh, able to be one of them there's one here someone says and i can't remember the name i didn't write it down but it says ask you about alto clarinets i don't know if that's a joke or if there's a story there or <laughs> uh i don't have really anything to say about alto clarinets what do I'm you ha- have you played alto clarinet or have you oh gosh uh, <laughs> uh i haven't played alto clarinet in 30 years okay so, so no yeah there seems to be a very small number of people who are really kind of into alto clarinets and then no one else really plays them all I gotta all I gotta say is if if you want to be the person that brings the alto clarinet into the world and makes it um, famous, you still have the chance to do it. So go for it. Yeah, that's true. It's it's it hasn't had its day, not yet. Um, so here's another question from Sarah Watts, actually, who we were just talking about. Um, she says, "Do you take your clarinet as hand luggage on the airplane when traveling, or do you insist on it being checked?" Oh, I always take it on. Um, yeah, I, I think she I never said that backwards because yeah, I think ins- you'd want to insist on taking it as hand luggage, right? Yeah, I'll actually tell you a story. Um, so I always take my bass clarinet on and I used to travel a lot more than I do with the bass clarinet and I used to travel with a different case. Right now I have a Wiseman case, which are a lot smaller and they're also a lot smaller looking, but I used to travel with a larger BAM case and the BAM cases are now smaller, but this was a big one. And, um, I would, I, I played a, in a group in Minnesota uh, called Zeitgeist in the 90s. Um, and I would travel back and forth from New York to Minnesota once a month um, for a couple weeks. So I was always on Northwest Airlines, which is no longer in business. Ha! Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I'm coming back from Northwest, uh, from Minnesota on Northwest, which always stopped off in Detroit. But it's, it was always the same plane. So you would get off the plane, they would do something to it, and you'd get back on the plane. I even left stuff on the plane. It was always the same plane. So, But I always took my bass clarinet with me. So I took my bass clarinet off the plane with me for this hour layover, and I'm getting back on the plane, and they stopped me at the gate, and they said, that, that won't fit in the overhead. And I said, 
I hope it's the same. It fit in the overhead from Minneapolis, so I, I hope it's the same plane because I left stuff on it. They're like, oh, it's the same plane, but it won't fit. I said, it. I just took it off. It totally fits. So I got into this thing with the guy. Okay, so note to people listening, don't argue with gate agents. It just doesn't go well for you. I didn't know that. <laughs> I said, you know what? F you. Okay, mistake number two. I argued with him. Second thing is I cursed at him. And I started walking down the jetway. At which point he starts talking into his wrist and saying things like, you know, passenger number 12 is corralled in the gateway. Please send security. So security descends on me and he and they they um, they're talking about arresting me. And uh, um, so I explained the whole situation, blah, blah, blah. They that was the only time that I had to uh, let them put it under the plane. But. Fortunately, and this is probably still the case on a lot of planes, they had a portion of the under under part of the plane, the, the uh, cargo area, that was heated and pressurized because I think there were pets in it. Okay, so they put they they put the base clarinet. I watched them put the base clarinet in there with the pets. I knew that it was going to be heated and pressurized, or the pets weren't going to survive. And when I got out, when I got back in New York, they they let me take it out by hand, and everything was fine. But uh, lesson learned. Uh, I went out and bought a Wiseman case. I haven't had a problem since. So the Wiseman case is a little smaller. That's the one that's kind of a circle or sort of yeah, a circle. It, it's <laughs> um, totally, um, uh, re, uh, it's pre- totally, a, yeah, it's a cylinder. Cylinder. That's the word I'm looking for. I was thinking yeah. of like a globe. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh that's a very, reminds me of that United Breaks Guitars book or whatever. Have you read yeah. that or heard about that? Yeah. Well, I've got to tell you, um, if it, Twitter didn't exist then, I'll put it that way. And if it had, I might have had a different outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's so weird, though. I, th- I think some of these people in the industry, um, we've had problems with airlines up here, and only now is, is one of the airlines really taken a stand to support musicians. But, I mean, a bass clarinet is worth as much as a small car, and some of these old violins and stuff, I mean, we're talking into the millions of dollars, I think. Like, they don't really realize how important it is that the instrument stays with the owner. <laughs> um, well, their argument is if it's that important, buy a ticket. Oh, and like set it next to you. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it is a tough situation, but yeah, the way airline tickets are these days. I mean, man, flying with the base, you wouldn't do that too many times. Let alone a contrabass. Yeah, forget it. I was asking Lori Friedman actually. She went on tour this year, and I was asking her about the contrabass on the plane and stuff, and it didn't sound fun. It's a very large instrument. Yeah, and you know, then when you get into the larger saxes, it's also a pain. Absolutely. So here's some questions that came in via email. Um, some, oh, here, sorry, there's one more from Facebook here. This is Natasha. Thanks for sending this in. And she says, I have played B-flat clarinet for eight years, but I'll be switching to bass clarinet soon. I was wondering if you could give any advice on how to transition. And uh, she gives some details about her mouthpiece and stuff. But do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that is a, it's a really good question. Um, and it's something that pretty much everybody who ever plays bass clarinet has to do at one point in their life. Um, you know, uh, I think the one thing that I say to clarinet players is don't expect the bass clarinet to feel like your clarinet. Um, if you do try to expect it, you're going to wind up playing a mouthpiece and reed combination that is too light. It's too soft for you. Um, the bass clarinet, it's going to feel larger in your mouth. Everything about the production of the sound is going to be bigger. Um, you know, the, obviously it's a larger mouthpiece. It's a bigger reed. It takes more air to get a sound out. Um, and the positioning of the back of your tongue is different. So you're just going to have to give yourself time and be patient with yourself, but ex- don't expect it to feel like a clarinet. So that said, um, you probably want to pick a reed that's maybe a half string softer than what you're used to, uh, just to get started to see if that feels right for you. Um, make sure you have a decent mouthpiece. Make sure your mouthpiece is not, um, you know, it's not the one that came with your bass clarinet or the bass clarinet that, you know, like if it's a school instrument, try to invest a hundred or two hundred dollars maximum in a decent mouthpiece for yourself. So at the very least you have that and a good read and a good, uh, good ligature, um, as a consistent thing for yourself. So that's, I, those are my few bits of advice for people who are, um, transitioning from clarinet to bass. I know you really like the Vandoren, uh, B50, I think it's called. Is that one that you'd recommend for the, anyone give a try or is that more like, a professional oh, going to require I, too much from the player. You know, I got to be honest with you. I don't believe in professional versus non-professional um, mouthpieces or reeds or even instruments. 
Um, yes, yeah, sorry. I guess what I meant was more like the resistance and, and kind of thing. And oh well, I mean, oh, look, I mean, the, if you live near a big city, certainly um, you have the luxury of being able to go and try a bunch of mouthpieces at a uh, at a store. But level, luckily, um, we have the internet. And if you have a credit card you can slap down, you can usually get a bunch of mouthpieces from a manufacturer or from a mouthpiece maker on trial. As long as you're careful with it and as long as you follow their rules, you will be able to send it back. Um, so th those are options too, that you don't have to choose a mouthpiece kind of blindly or take someone's advice like my advice and say, go get a B50. You should try a bunch of mouthpieces for yourself and see what feels right for you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It, it's hard for someone to suggest like, look, this is the read you should use. I mean, they might be t totally different than you or, <laughs> or uh, you know, like different things, right? Exactly. I mean, to get started, you know, if you're going to choose between the, the BD5, the B40 or the B50 um, base client mouthpieces from Van Dorn, you might want to try the B40 first. It's a little bit it's a little bit smaller, closer than the B50. The B50 is pretty huge. Um, Selmer has a couple of terrific mouthpieces. One is the Selmer Focus. The other one's the Selmer Concept. The Concept is a little bit bigger like the B50. The Focus is a little bit smaller like the B40. And then, of course, uh, Rico. Uh, Didario has a bunch of mouthpieces, and then everybody and their brother is a mouthpiece refacer these days. So you literally have hundreds of choices. So pick a few of them and see see um, you know how they feel for you. I forgot to mention this part of the question, but she says she also plays some jazz tenor sax. I think that would be probably fairly helpful versus where most clarinet players are starting. Um, you know, maybe try something a little bit bigger with a softer read. Like you know, I play a B fifty with a two and a half, and a two and a half read is almost absurd you know when you think about it because a lot of fifth graders play on two and a half reads but when you have a mouthpiece that big a softer read is what you need give it a shot yeah you know i've recently switched to a more open softer read setup too i think more players are going that way these days i don't know why i don't know i mean i know some people who play a really close setup with you know two by fours on there and <laughs> yeah. on, so whatever whatever yeah well whatever works right i mean right exactly so all those kind of questions they actually a, a lot of the ones that come in i i I have to be honest, I sometimes filter them out because it's it's so difficult to have this chance to talk to people and then, you know, at, at 10 people ask what kind of ligature do you use kind of thing, you know, and and uh, you've even got that video about ligatures and how in some ways it's really just about the feel and not so much about much else, you know, it's very personal. Exactly. And so. it, it's difficult to be able to say, you know, also I get a lot of, a lot of uh, email myself with people asking like, um, you know, I've got this problem and I can't play this note or there's something wrong with my instrument. It would be the equivalent of me calling a doctor and saying, you know, my stomach kind of hurts. What's wrong with me? Uh, you kind of have to have a little bit more information. You need, uh, you know, from the person to know what it could possibly be wrong with them. So it's sometimes really difficult to both diagnose a problem from somebody, also to recommend a solution for somebody, um, you know. And for band teachers who might be listening to this, this is one of the things that really bothers me about just getting a class set of mouthpieces of whatever brand and style and making every kid use a three and a half read. It's just it it just doesn't really work that way. It's like asking them all to wear the same size size of pants. <laughs> well, I mean, on a yeah, on clarinet, you know, there are some mouthpieces, five RV lyre, for example, that a lot of teachers put um, beginning clarinet players on. Um, but more often than not, the band director is going to be like, whatever came with your instrument, just slap a read on it and let's go, um, which is fair. Not everybody is going to be interested in getting a great mouthpiece or a great read. So as a band director, and I'm not one, as a band director, I could imagine being like, well, let's see what we've got to start with. And then people who are interested, when, when a student comes to them, you know, then maybe the band director can put a question or two out on, let's say, woodwind.org to the clarinet list or to some flute list or a bassoon list to get sort of more professional teacher advice on that particular instrument. Yeah, I mean, the one in the box isn't even that bad just to kind of get a start with. And when they're ready, they can go out and pick something for them. So exactly. Anyways, so uh, on to some emails here. This is Tony Park, who I know he actually is living in New York right now. Uh, Queens, I think, or Astoria. Mm -hmm. And he's coming back to Calgary soon, I think. Anyways. <laughs> Hi, Tony. And um, his first question is, how and why did you get into advertising, and uh, how did you become so good at it? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm good at it, but um, <laughs> uh, it's it's a great question. I am. Um, I did a. I loved making recital posters in college. For me, getting make putting on recitals 
part of the fun, in fact, a lot of the fun, maybe even most of the fun, was making the recital posters at Eastman. Um, and I was, I really loved making different posters for different environments and figuring out where the locations were where people would actually read the posters. So I was really interested in media. If you think about it, like where would somebody read the poster is the equivalent of saying, where should I have my ad shown? Should it be on television or should it be on the side of a bus shelter? Um, and then what do I say to those people in that context? That is advertising. And I always have loved that. And so now instead of making recital posters for myself, I make ads for companies like Samsung um, and uh, E-Trade and Verizon and Mercedes. So, you know, wow. yeah. So those are some of the clients that I work on. But it's to me, it's just it's it all comes from making recital posters. That's so interesting. And, and not to mention there was uh, also your discography. I think you did all the design on the CDs. Over all the years? But the, all but the first one, yeah. Totally. So um, he also says, when when did you start doing more non-musical things than musical things? Uh, it was a big shift in 2005. I, I, the summer of 2005, I made a decision uh, to leave the New Jersey Symphony. And that same week I left, uh, and I was not a member of it, but I played a lot with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra and Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center and the Klezmatics. And... Uh, in one week, I resigned from all of them and took a job uh, for McCann, which is a big ad agency. Hmm. Um, that answers another one of his questions, which was, why did you leave the, or why did you stop playing with New Jersey Symphony, which I guess is, that's, that's the reason, I suppose. Um, he also says, who were your most influential and favorite clarinet teachers and why? Um, well, I, I loved John Ye. I mean, all of my teachers I loved. Um, I was very fortunate to not have a teacher that I didn't. Uh, love. John Ye was my first teacher. John Broussier is, the, of course, uh, clarinetist in the Chicago Symphony. But when I met him, he was 24 or 23. And he, um, I think he had just switched over from bass clarinet. He started Chicago Symphony as bass clarinetist. So he was, he, he sounds amazing on the bass clarinet. And I, uh, I still, every time I play the bass clarinet, I, I hear his sound in my ear before I play a note. It's, it's gorgeous. So John was also just a huge support for me when I was a kid. Um, Richard McDowell uh, was a great uh, transitional teacher for me, leaving Chicago, going up to Interlock and Arts Academy uh, for my senior year. And he was the one that really sort of cracked the whip on me, made me learn scales, made me do uh, Jean Jean etudes, made me rip through all of the rows. He did not... He, he, you know, obviously, you're up there and you're immersed in it, so that's what he did. And then I went and studied with Charlie Nydick for... God, uh, for four years at Eastman and then uh, f four or five more years at Stony Brook after I spent my year with Harry Sparnay uh, in Holland. So all of these teachers uh, have had different impacts on me. Harry Sparnay probably um, had the most influence on me in terms of how I deal with performing and how I address audiences. And um, he gave me a lot of the courage that I have to sort of follow a path that was not necessarily one that anyone else had, including what he had followed. So uh, I give Harry a lot of props for that. But, you know, all of them, Charlie especially, I spent eight years with the guy. He, you know, my, my playing has a lot to do with Charlie. So those are, all those, those are all my teachers. I love them all. That's fantastic. Yeah, I remember Harry talking about kind of finding your own voice and um, going where you want to go with the music. And I think a lot of people are, are doing a great job of that these days, um, not following a traditional sort of path. Um, Tony's next question is, where do you see classical music in 10 years? Oh boy. Uh, my crystal ball is broken. Um, <laughs> but you know, I see smaller and smaller groups. I see more chamber music. Um, I think the larger orchestras are always going to exist. I just think fewer of them are going to exist. And that, that, um, it's just an economy of scale, you know, to have such a, maybe it's the opposite of an economy of scale, to have such a huge, expensive organism like an orchestra um, and an audience that is going to be um, coming to that, that same audience could go see a string quartet. Hell, that same audience could just stay home and watch Netflix. So I think that there's an economy that we have to, that is being figured out by groups like ICE and Alarm Will Sound, which are sort of not chamber music size, but sort of smaller ensemble, maybe a dozen players. Uh, I see that as being the future of, uh, of classical music. And then the word classical itself, I don't know 
how you can really define that so much anymore because we lived in a we live in a world of really fractured musical styles. I mean, when we were when I was a kid, there were maybe six or eight music styles. There was jazz and there was rock and there was pop and then there was classical and there, you know, but now everything is so micro targeted that it, I don't even know what classical music is anymore. But that said, we'll call it art music, music that's intended to be listened to as a focus, not to be done something like cooked to or ah, hell, I cooked a classical music. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that the whole you're right. The whole term is kind of going a little wonky. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking now, what if we change that instead of 10 years to be like 50 years or 25 years? I, I think that the direction you're saying is absolutely true. I see a lot of orchestras are kind of drying up and they're so hard to sustain and but for every orchestra that closes i hear about five new small ensembles so well that's the great thing i think i'm 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 convinced that live music is not dying i just think that certain types of live music are harder to sustain and those are the ones that are not going to survive yeah it's interesting glenn gould back in the 80s used to think that live music was a thing of would become a thing of the past by about 2000 but I, th- I think that people actually love it more than ever. I mean, people love going to their favorite artists. And, you know, even at Clarinet Fest, we were just there and there was four days of solid clarinet performances and everyone was fairly well attended. So, people... yeah, I, I, there is room for everything. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, Tony's last question, and then we'll move on to Amy's here. Uh, he says, What do you wish to tell young musicians and clarinetists who are students or emerging professionals? Uh, some of you who have ever seen me talk about this live, this will sound familiar to you. But um, for those of you who haven't, the one thing that I wish that um, maybe a teacher told me when I was in college, I was in a conservatory, so I was among some of the best musicians in the country. Uh, I wish somebody told me that you don't have to make a living as a musician to be a musician. Um, Because when I left music, it was a real struggle, 10 or 11 years ago, when I decided to switch gears, really, uh, it was a real struggle for me to come to grips with the fact that I felt like I was selling out or I was giving up. And now looking back at it, uh, having been doing what I'm doing now for 10 years, it has been the most productive, fun, satisfying um, way of experiencing music I'm so glad I made the change. It's not for everybody. Um, Obviously, advertising is not for everybody, and leaving music as a full-time thing is not an option for everybody. But for me, just knowing that I didn't have to have a career in music to be a musician is something that I really wish somebody had told me sooner. That's so interesting to me, because haven't most of your major works come out in the last 10 years, like your, your CDs? Uh, more than half of them, yeah. Yeah, so like it's been just as prolific, if not more. Um, so it's 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 just interesting to me that way. Yeah. Do you think that allows you to kind of take a break mentally and come back to it and, and do it for yourself more? Totally, and it also allows me to not have to rely on um, playing music that I don't want to play. Yeah, and it, yeah. And and to answer one of Tony's other questions, sort of, I, I was not enjoying playing in an orchestra. It is a, it is kind of a repressive thing for me where I had to do not just what the conductor told me to do, but I had to do what the principal player told me to do. And I had to do what the first oboist would suggest that I do because I was playing bass clarinet. I don't really have, I, I never had the option to make the decisions of how I wanted to play a piece of music. Everything was decided for me and I had to just execute it. Just not what I was into. Well, I think a lot of people actually have sort of a, I don't know, if, when they do start playing with orchestras, if, if they realize that it's not for them, they almost feel guilty or lost because they went to school thinking that was the goal. And then they sort of find out that it's, it's just not them. I mean, what, what would you say to those people? Um, well, uh, hopefully they hear me now. Um, but, it, you know, it, you got to do what you enjoy. Um, if playing in an orchestra is the only way for you to make a living, then you have to, you know, either if you can't make, if you can't get out of it, um, make the best of it and find other outlets for yourself. I certainly know a lot of other, a lot of orchestral clarinet players, and I will not name any of them. They have wonderful lives outside of the orchestra and they're able to do music and they're able to do things outside of music. Some of them uh, are repair people. Some of them make mouthpieces. Uh, A lot of them teach. So they find um, sort of their voice 
as it were, outside of the orchestra, and the orchestra is a way for them to sort of practice their craft, uh, mm -hmm. which is always a good thing to be able to do. Yeah, no, I'm not discounting the orchestra. I think a lot of people really like playing with the orchestra, but a lot of people, not only do they find out it's not for them, but they also find that even if they want it so badly, there's not a job for them. So, because... Well, I heard somebody say it's actually, uh, it's easier to to become president of the United States than it is to get a flute job because um, at least the pre <laughs> at least the presidency opens up every four years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's a crazy world out there. And actually, I haven't had an orchestral, uh, full-time orchestral clarinetist on yet. That's got to be on my radar. But anyway, so let's move on to Amy's questions. And Amy um, is someone you met at uh, Clarinet Fest, actually. I think she, she said she played your bass clarinet or something. She was all excited about it. <laughs> um, anyway, so she says, first of all, can you just make a shout out and say that I really respect him and thank you for years of inspiration? Um, okay, so Amy's first question, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, but I think she's asking about kind of the causes in music culture and the trends in music that led to the development of the bass clarinet and who, who are the key people who kind of paved the way? Okay, well... Um Obviously, Eric Dolphy, um, but even before Eric Dolphy uh, was this guy named Josef Horak, who was a Czech bass clarinetist. In the 50s, I think he gave the very first bass clarinet and piano recital. Uh, at least he's credited with that. But so Josef Horak on the classical side and, of course, Eric Dolphy on the jazz side um, are two of the people that put the instrument on the map. But you have to remember that the bass clarinet is kind of a young instrument, like the saxophone is kind of a young instrument that both of them, the bass clarinet um, had its origins a long, long time ago, but it was Adolf Sax who, um, in addition to making the saxophone, was the person who uh, modernized the bass clarinet and made it kind of operate and work the way it, and look the way it looks today, which is no... The, it's kind of no wonder why the bass clarinet kind of looks like a saxophone. They were both kind of modernized, one invented and one modernized by Adolf, Adolf Sax. But it's if you can think about it, that's a pretty, that's not that long ago. So mm -hmm. the bass clarinet itself uh, evolved as an orchestral instrument in the turn of the century, the turn of the last century. And then uh, there wasn't any solo repertoire for it. And then this guy, Josef Horak, shows up and he's doing it. And then Eric Dolphy starts playing it as a solo instrument and making records, jazz records on it. And those two things together, plus sort of the, um, you know, the 70s and the 80s and, the uh, you know, solo music that's now what we would call contemporary music, all of that kind of converged to uh, put the bass clarinet on the map. So her next question actually is very much related to this. Um... That's a great answer, by the way. I don't know if as many people know that Adolf Sax sort of modernized the bass clarinet as they should, but you're right. It does explain why people always ask, hey, what's that big black saxophone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But her next question is, what are some pieces that have become staples for the bass clarinet repertoire that were once considered new music? Oh, wow. Staples. Um, that's a hard one. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there are any. Uh, to be honest with you. I mean, there are pieces that a lot of students certainly play. The Osborne Rhapsody is something that a lot of, it's written for clarinet, but a lot of bass clarinetists will play that. Um, but goodness, I, I don't know if there's any standard rep. There's certainly big pieces, like um, Barrio wrote uh, a piece, Zanakis, Yanis Zanakis wrote a concerto called Echange, which is a, which is a large scale work uh, that are pretty famous. And then there's some solo works um, that are, I guess pretty much everyone plays, I would say, maybe Lee Sung Yoon monologue. Um, Dolphy's transcription of God Bless the Child is very popular. A lot of people play that. And just a little plug, you can get that for free on my site. Uh, you can download that for free, the Dolphy transcription. For that matter, you can download the Echange as well. Um, anyway, th but there isn't really a standard rep. Not like there's no Mozart concerto for the bass clarinet. Mm -hmm. What about like uh, like the time and motion study for anyhow, that kind of oh. thing? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think there's probably only a handful of people who have played that in the world. Um, I haven't. Uh, I, I refuse to. <laughs> it's just too hard. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm not really sure her question is staple. I'm trying to figure out if she means staple for like what would a student play on a recital or like sort of cornerstones of the repertoire. I'm not. I think I was assuming I was assuming she meant cornerstones of the rep. But um, mm -hmm. goodness, I mean, then if it's just pieces that a student should play, there's a ton of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, I think the bass clarinet, one thing that's cool about it is it's, it's because it's so new and it doesn't have 
the sort of history that uh, the, the clarinet has going back as far anyways, it can kind of be everything and whatever you want it to be, you know, it's so versatile. It is. And it also has a lot less baggage than mm-hmm. the clarinet. I mean, you'll go to a clarinet recital as a clarinet player. Uh, well, I won't, but some people might go to a clarinet recital as a clarinet player and, and listen to a piece of music and be very judgmental about it. Like that doesn't sound the way I want it to sound, or he's not, she is not interpreting it the way that I want to interpret it. But it seems like when you go hear a bass clarinet player, everybody is just more chill. They're like, yeah, I could get into that. That's not bad. And people are a lot less judgmental. Um, I know I am, uh, even, I mean, I have to say, honestly, when I go hear someone play the Mozart concerto, it's almost impossible for me not to um, uh, listen to an interpretation that doesn't, that isn't exactly the way mine is and be judgmental about it. But bass clarinet, I'm not that way. So I don't know. It's, it's so better. interesting. People get that way, though. I mean, even uh, Michael Norsworthy, who, of course, you know, when he was on the show, he was talking about playing the piece like uh, in your own way and putting your own voice into it. And so many people want to hear it the way they heard it on a CD or something like that. I think that's the difference between a student who is learning, and we all, all of us learn by imitating, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how we learn speech. Um, so it's, there's a difference between a student who's learning and someone who has re- achieved a certain degree of proficiency on the instrument finding their own voice. I think those are two different stages in a, in a playing life. So Amy's next question is, uh, being a bass clarinetist at the beginning, what was your mission starting out? Um, did it have to do with something bigger than yourself or something else, or where did it come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty deep I, questions here. Yeah. Um, so I started bass clarinet when I was 10. So I don't think there was anything deep going on uh, other than the fact that I got to be first chair um, in the band. So, so did there, you say you started bass clarinet at 10? Yeah. So I, I, uh, I you know, there, there was nothing bigger than the fact that uh, I was first chair. I was also last chair. I was the only chair. Um, <laughs> But but uh, that was the only only thing that I was thinking about at the time was how cool it was that I was first chair. That's so funny though, because some kids are like as tall as a bass clarinet at ten. So how did you how did you play it? Were you a tall kid or? Um, I guess I was a little bit taller. Um, I had a low E flat bass clarinet, which is obviously oh that helps yeah a, f- a fair bit shorter. And I also played it over to the side. I didn't play it in front of me with a peg. I didn't know any better, so I played it like a saxophone because I thought it looked like a saxophone, and that made it look even cooler. So maybe, maybe I missed this story, but what, what got you inspired to play the bass clarinet over the regular clarinet? Just simply the fact you'd be the, the, first, the, the only one in the chair? Or? Well, the, the long story, that's the short story. Okay. The longer story is that I played, I started on the clarinet uh, as a fourth grader, but I played on the clarinet that my mom played on in the 1950s, that my sister played on in the 1960s and 70s, and I think my other sister may have played it. And then it sat around for 10 years, and then I got it. So here's this thing that is, it's, it was an old wooden instrument. It was in terrible shape. It barely, barely played. It leaked all over the place. I'm sure it was cracked. And everybody else in the band got their new plastic clarinets, their Bundys, and I had this thing, and I couldn't play it. And so I wound up moving myself very quickly from fourth through sixth grade to last chair in the band. And so my band director saw... Um, an opportunity to um, work, to put me in a place where I would do less damage, <laughs> and he put, he, he put me on bass clarinet, thinking that if I was going to suck, I might as well suck on an instrument that nobody else can hear. And he put me on the bass clarinet, and I just took to it. That's hilarious. It's funny how um, the instrument was kind of holding you back, and then you got this sort of cool opportunity to switch up, and you stuck with it. Well, yeah, and it was that first summer that I went to Interlochen uh, for summer camp. Yeah, and I and every year after that through high school, I I went to Interlochen. Crazy, and then eventually though, that's where all your high school friends were there, and of course that eventually led to that 1985 piece. (laughs) Yeah, well, all my high school friends actually were were in Chicago. I spent my last year of high school. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent summers at Interlochen, but only my last year of high school, I went to Interlochen Arts Academy, and that's when that 1985. uh, tape got made oh i see that's always such a funny story for those who don't know there's this piece um that uh michael has made with kind of a tape of these recordings that people made of in high school or something it was maybe you can describe it better than me well it's on youtube actually uh van doren recorded it and put it out on youtube so you could probably look at oh, you have 19... the i'll put the link I'll put the yeah link. I'll, you can put the link up great So there's a couple more questions here. I'm going to just sort of shorten them a little bit, just in the interest of time. Um, We're coming up on an hour, of course. Um, So this one is, what qualities do you think the bass clarinet 
the bass clarinetist should embody to make a significant com- contribution to the repertoire or the community? Kind, um, of a, kind of a tough one. No, actually, I have a pretty easy answer for that. Oh, yeah? um, I, I think the, the key is being um, not being afraid, um, being fearless, and be willing to screw up. Um, so, in other words, fear is the enemy of creativity. It doesn't matter what kind of creativity. It doesn't matter if you're an artist or a musician or a, a writer. If you're afraid, you're limiting yourself because you're afraid of something bad happening. So being unafraid and being willing to make a mistake and being willing to be, I guess, embarrassed uh, is, the, is the key to making a contribution because the only time that you're going to actually make something new is when you're not afraid to make something new. Well, I love that. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, it kind of leads into the next question, actually. What do you look for in a student and what is your approach to teaching? Uh, I look f- Personally, I look for students who have reached a certain level of accomplishment on the clarinet and bass clarinet. I don't take um, bre- beginner students uh, anymore. Um, so what I look for in a student is maybe different uh, than you know some other teachers, but it doesn't even matter... Uh, their age or whatever, they have to um, they have to practice and they have to care about how they sound and they have to have a certain degree of discipline. Now that's kind of funny for me to say that because I didn't have that <laughs> when I was 14, 13 <laughs> years old. But when I'm looking for students, I need I, I need to have somebody that takes the work they're doing seriously, but doesn't take themselves too seriously. Hmm. Um, and so there's there's a difference there because you need to have a certain degree of you need to go with the flow as a person, but you need to be very disciplined in terms of the work that you have to do. And I can tell right away if I'm going to have a student that's going to work and that cares or that's just kind of, uh, you know, coasting. And this actually flows great into the next question, which is uh, what mantras and perspectives um, did you yourself use as a student to get through the rigors of music? Um, how did you deal with things like competition, mean people, <laughs> obstacles in life, rejection, feeling stuck, anything like that? Any stories? Oh, wow. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Amy, these are great questions. I <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that, that, you know, there are times when you'll walk into, well, let me tell you, I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I remember when I was a freshman at Eastman. Now, I didn't get into Eastman right off. I was on the waiting list. Um, and I was able to get into Eastman sort of late uh, and there, so I, I came into the school thinking that I didn't belong there. And I remember going into my very first, um, kind of clarinet get together. It wasn't even a playing party or anything. It was just, we were all hanging out. And I remember walking in and thinking everybody in this room is better than me and feeling really like, uh, I will never be able to achieve what these people have achieved. I don't even belong here. And there's a certain amount of doubt that you have. And I think that's normal. I think there's a lot of, it, it's totally normal to have self-doubt and it's healthy to have self, self-doubt. self But what's what's what I had to make sure that I didn't let that turn into was an excuse to not get better. Um, because a lot of times you'd be like, oh, well, what's the use? I'm, you know, everyone here is so much better than me. Why do I even bother? That is, you might as well quit the clarinet because that's, that's, that's a poisonous attitude. So I had to make sure that I didn't have that attitude. And I also tried to make sure that I, I, I didn't feel competitive with any of the other players because at school or for the rest of my life for that matter, because music is not a sport. It's not like I can jump higher or run faster or swim faster or ski faster, or do any of these other things. It's not like that. It's, it, it, it is, uh, it's a different kind of pursuit. And if you're always thinking about doing something better or winning, and I know in, in the United States and a lot of other places for that matter, competitions are about you winning and someone else losing. Music is not a zero sum game where I have to, if some, I have to beat someone in order to win. I think that we can all win together and we can all win separately. And it's not, it's not like that. So I think that that's an important distinction that we have to make. It's, it's hard to remember, especially as a young person uh, in music, that it's not, competition is not a sport. It's a competition about doing you the best that you can. I suppose that there's some in sports that say sports is about that as well. But um, I think that having, having to let go of some of these poisonous thoughts uh, about com- competition and your feelings of inadequacy and all, all that sort of stuff are, are the key to focusing on what really matters, and that is playing as well as you can. And then finally, um, 
there was a point in my life, I think I had finished my, or was about to finish my master's degree, when I realized that there were things that I was just never going to be able to do well. There were certain things on the clarinet and the B-flat clarinet that I would never be able to do well. There were certain things on the bass clarinet that I couldn't do well. And there was that point where I just had to say, you know what, I'm okay with that. I don't have to do that well in order to have a, a fun, successful life. It was not keeping me from being able to be expressive on the clarinet or the bass clarinet. Um, and so I was able to release those things and not dwell on them. And that's a really important transition. And uh, Amy, Ami, this is important for you to know, so I'm going to speak directly to you. You have to leave the notion of being a student behind some point, at some point, and you have to start feeling like you are you as a musician and you are complete. Whether or not you can be perfect at everything, you have to feel like you are complete. Okay? So hopefully that's helpful. That's a great answer. Yeah, and I think that I, I love the sports analogy um, because sports are also so much more objective. Like you can see that person X jumps so high because they literally jumped exactly <laughs> that measurement on the on the ruler, you know. Um, but just because you can't jump as high doesn't mean you can't jump. And with music, it's just because you, you know, you may not be able to play your scale as absolutely fast as one person next to you, but you might be able to play it more interestingly to someone's ears. And there is no objective answer to why someone might like it more. That, that's exactly right. And, um, and that's just important to remember, especially as you get out of high school and into college and you get out of this whole, um, you know, uh, competition circuit that a lot of musicians get into to, you know, leave that behind and start focusing on playing for you. Absolutely. So this is, we got two more questions left. Um, this last next one is you've worked with a lot of musicians. Um, are there any kind of interesting stories or people you liked working or collaborating with the most? Um, I mean, I have my best friend whose name is Todd Reynolds. He's a violin player. He's on almost every record of mine and he's been, um, the most important, uh, peer musician in my life. Um, and, you know, of course I've played with some really amazing people, um, you know, some f very famous people. Um, but, but actually what I find to be the most interesting in the, where I've learned the most and grown the most as a musician is, is with your peers. Um, so I have all of the people that I've played with, some of whom probably nobody on this podcast will have ever heard of. Those are the people that have had the greatest influence on me because you are it, it's a give and take. And I think that that's really important um, as a musician to find people and surround yourself with people that you can learn from and teach teach to, I guess, in a certain sense. And in college, that's actually more important as far as I'm concerned than picking the right teacher is picking the right env environment and the right colleagues that you want to spend those four years with. Because you only spend an hour a week with your teacher, but you spend the rest of the time with your colleagues and you do a hell of a lot of learning when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not to mention you're going to be literally playing with those people if you stay in that city for the rest of your career. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to build, build uh, those relationships. So, Michael, we have one more question, and it's kind of a, a group of questions. It's something I call the lightning round, and they're just kind of quick questions that um, kind of just answer with the first thing that comes to your head and um, just sort of a quick answer to something to share real quick at the end here. Um, the first one is, if I was to walk over to a music stand right now, what would I find? David Lang's press release. Uh, <laughs> what is one book you'd recommend to all clarinetists? Um... The Inner Game of Tennis. Oh, it's interesting. That's not the first time. Is that an Eastman thing? Everyone, everybody read that. Yeah, because my. Do you know Glenn Price? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, he recommended that when I was in university too. So, anyways, here I am ruining the lightning round. <laughs> what is the best piece of advice you ever received, and who gave it to you? The best piece of advice I got was from Harry Sparney, and that is to make a connection with the audience. Um, you know, you're not some kind of diva with you know. Uh, Wagner horns on stage. You're a bass clarinetist. You're a real person, and you need to have a connection with the audience. And I've taken that so uh, to heart, and I try and do that myself. Absolutely. What is your all-time favorite piece of music? And I know this is a tough one. Um, I'm going to say it is uh, Rimsky Korsakov's Capriccio Espanol. Wow, interesting. Um, and the last one: If you could meet any composer or musician, past or present, who would it be, and why? I'd like to meet Stravinsky. Um, because here's a guy that, um, first of all, I love 
just about everything that Stravinsky wrote, but also Stravinsky is a guy that figured out how to make a living doing music. And he was, he, he took his music very seriously, but it didn't seem like he took himself that seriously, uh, from everything that I've read and from talking with Robert Kraft, who was his biographer. Uh, it seems that that, that was the case. He just passed away last year or a couple months ago. It's so terrible. Yeah. Anyways, well, thank you so much. This was an absolutely great um, conversation, and thank you to everyone who sent in questions. I think this yes, was a really you. this is a fun way to do this. It was sort of interesting for me to sit back and and just uh, just ask the questions instead of sort of composing them in that way. So I like that, and and I do I do appreciate the time that people took to to send those in. So I guess there's sort of one last question, and that is where <laughs> can we find you online? You can find me probably the place that most of you are going to find me is on YouTube, and my channel is Ear Spasm. Um, and if you want to find me and where I live online, that's earspasm.com. And I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Michael. I hope to have you back someday in the future. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thanks to everyone who had questions. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. Thank you.